Andrew Barron. I'm an associate lecturer. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I passed that level about a while ago. I'm Andrew Barron. I'm an associate professor in biological sciences at Macquarie University. And this is a particularly exciting time to be involved in neuroscience. I think that we're seeing an explosion of possibility. There was a while when we were limited by the experimental techniques and, the, and that limited the amount of data that we could gather. We're now in a new situation where, if anything, we're capable of generating more data than we know what to do with. It means that questions of really broad, broad scope can be addressed now. We're limited more by our capacity to imagine what we can do with the data than by our capacity to generate the data, and that's what makes it particularly exciting. Um, so the, the question is about emergence in neuroscience, and what we've recognized for a while is that any neurobiological system, it, by necessity, is an evolved and self-organized system. And that means it doesn't work in the ways that we would apply simple mechanical processes to things. Um, it also means that we've had a habit of using the words self-organized and emergence as rather catch-all tools for magic happens, but the, process, the mechanism of it is too complex for us to analyze, because if we try to use a simple reductionist approach that would remove an element and see what it does, that approach doesn't work if your system is self-organized and if your system has massive degeneracy and is massively redundant. Because if you remove an element, the system will reconfigure itself and most likely maintain its performance. And so you're not learning very much about how the system operates. Um, the hope I'm seeing now is that people are getting very intelligent about how self-organized systems can operate. And where I think the excitement is, is actually analyzing the mechanisms of emergence and moving away from emergence being the catch-all magic that something unknown happened and actually working out how it's possible for a new level of organization and these exciting emergent properties to emerge from a system that had no designer. So uh, swarm intelligence is not something I'm actively researching, but it still interests me. Um, I work with honeybees as my model system. My primary research interest is in working out how the honeybee brain works. You can consider a network of neurons as a group of individually mindless cooperating elements. You can think of a swarm of bees as a group of individually mindless cooperative elements. In both cases, both manifest emergent properties. A swarm has its own patterns of behavior. A swarm is able to make a unitary decision and to manifest goal-directed behavior. Similarly, a network of neurons is able to make a unitary decision and manifest goal-directed behavior. And what's interesting is that mathematically you can approach both systems in very, very similar ways to analyze how it's possible for these self-organized cooperative elements to do this, to achieve a unitary output from a group of completely independent but interacting elements. So I think the reason for neuroscientists to be interested in an organism like the honeybee is it's an informative point of reflection, a possible informative prototype for a study of a more complex mind like a mammalian mind or a human mind. What we see in the honeybee is, if we look at the behavioral level, the honeybee manifests many of the behaviors that we see in humans and other mammals. Um, certainly they're capable of incredibly complicated learning and memory. Certainly they're capable of robust decision. Um, they uh, solve very complicated navigational tasks extremely well. They make intelligent economic decisions of what they will gather and how they will gather it. They're solving all of the survival problems that every animal has to face and solving it incredibly well. And yet, compared to any mammal, their brain is minuscule. Now, if we want to understand how things like decision, learning, memory, and problem solving emerge from a brain, it's easier to target the simpler system and the honeybee gives us that simpler system. In terms of neurons, the bee has just shy of a million, somewhere between 800,000 and a million neurons. Clearly, for any modeling project, it's much easier to address something like that than to address a human brain that has a, somewhere in the order of 100,000 million. See, I think, I, I, get, I get the mouse thing. Mm -hmm. The problem with the mouse thing for me is that a lab mouse isn't and hasn't been for generations solving a real world problem. A lab mouse is in a box, yeah? So yeah, you can ask questions of how does the mouse learn? But with the bee, we can ask questions, how does the bee navigate across a real world What's the, terrain? Like, for instance, in mouse, they have 99% of DNA, 98% of yeah. DNA they share. What's the percentage of oh, the DNA? Oh, mate, 
nothing like that high. So it's but, but there's funky stuff. So there's the honeybee genome is more similar to the human genome than to Drosophila, uh -huh. okay. which is kind of cool. Yeah. But there's still, it's nothing like the homology. And we know that also structurally. I mean, you've got a structural homology between mouse and human. We don't have that in a honeybee. So the people are making arguments about really, really deep ancient basal homology, but you can't say that there is a hippocampus. You, so mouse has a hippocampus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for me, that, that point of difference is also really cool. So if a honeybee doesn't have a hippocampus, it still does it. but it's solving navigation, then what is the core process? That's, that's not necessary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somehow it's doing it without the hippocampus. There's either something that is fundamentally core about how you might solve a navigational mm -hmm. calculation. And if we can solve that for mouse and honeybee, then we can ask, okay, computationally with the self-organized system, how do you solve a navigational problem? And that I think is even more exciting than going, yeah, mouse has hippocampus, mouse has kind of place cells. Ants and bees, very, very similar behavior to yeah. us. And we've got a very exciting project looking exactly at how ants navigate. Uh, for exactly this reason. And the ants are a really informative case study because for 50 years we've studied the natural um, ethology of a navigating ant. So we know what cues it uses, what celestial cues it uses, how it counts steps. We don't know its neurobiological mechanism. So we know the information problem. It has step counting, it uses celestial cues, it uses landmarks, and it has phenomenal visual memory of landmark configurations. We know that. So we can, we can suggest what calculations might be going on. We don't have a sense of where in the brain those calculations are processed and how they're processed. And that's what we want to tackle now. And whether now. they are at all, all in the brain, because like Ogil and the philosopher use the case of ants finding their way to, to a beach as yes. an example of distributed cognition. Yes. So, so the question is, you know, do ants have distributed cognition? Now, there are some ant species that rely on pheromone trails. Mm -hmm. You could argue that's very distributed because what happens there is one ant lays a trail. That's additional information for an independent individual that can then incorporate that in its navigational task. So you're moving into a distributed system. The ants we're choosing to work on don't lay pheromones because of that complexity. So we want the ants to be able to rely on, on how their own assessments of the spatial situation. So we've removed the additional layer of pheromonal complexity from it. Um, but again, what's interesting about the ants that have this capacity for distributed cognition, their own brains are very much smaller than the species we're choosing to look at. It's like they've offloaded some of their cognitive processing into an environmental solution rather than an onboard cognitive solution. I could see the applications of distributed cognition being phenomenal. Um, I don't think that we're even yet imagining quite how significant it could be. But the analogy that I sometimes play around with is that if we could even get a, a car that could navigate with the fidelity of an ant, autonomously navigate rather than using an external GPS, that would be a phenomenal advance in terms of pilotless autonomous vehicles. If we could give each of those vehicles a capacity to know where other vehicles had been and where they were in a distributed sense. All vehicles could optimize all routes all of the time for maximum safety and efficiency. Now, what that would do in terms of reducing road death, in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, would be phenomenal. Just in terms of the need for car ownership would plummet if you could reliably say, well, yeah, there's a lot of vehicles that are currently underutilized and I can just tack into that. And I don't think we're even thinking seriously about the capacity for that sort of distributed cognitive problem to how do we move things from A to B across a cooperative cognitive system. Um, are humans offloading cognition to the environment? We may be starting to. I think that what we're doing now individually as humans is that we are cognitively processing far more than we ever used to because we're carrying devices that assist us the entire time. Um, we have access to more information than we've ever had, and we have external data depositories that help us store, process, sort, and re-access that. I, there's no way that I'm now storing my reference library in my head. I used to do that as an early undergraduate, but not now. Now I just sort of have it in EndNote. I can barely even remember papers I've even looked at because there's just too many of them. So I think we're beginning to offload, but I think what we're seeing is an increase in the capacity of individuals now. I think that's also having consequences for how individuals are learning and how individuals are approaching learning. I don't think that in, um, academically we're even beginning to catch up to that yet. I could be about to rant, but I won't.
the bionic brain project, the bionic brain is a deliberately carefully undefined term that we use as a catch-all for whatever suits us at the moment. Um, what bionic brain means to me is um, an approach, an attempt to use, to try, well, what, is, what actually is it? To me, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create solutions to problem solving that are biomorphic. So the plan is that we learn how a simple organism, um, how it learns, how it remembers, how it classifies information, how it navigates. And then we take that information as the basis for a set of software commands that can drive a robot. So the robot has the cognitive capacities that mirror the organism. And our plan is that it be entirely biomorphic. So we don't want to build AI from first principles. We want to learn how intelligence is manifest in a, bi in a biological brain and then use that information as the core of our bionic brain. So the concern there is that if we use an evolutionary algorithm to, to manifest an intelligence solution, would we therefore understand enough of the system to be able to control the system? Um, to be clear, the intention of the bionic brain is not to use an evolutionary algorithm. Um, we want to do actually quite the opposite. It's important to us that we understand exactly how the system operates because the, the intention of the bionic brain is twofold. One is that we will get solutions for autonomous behavior, but the other and the most important application for me is that we'll understand how biological circuits manifest these higher order properties that we consider to be cognitive. So for bionic brain, it's not a matter of running an evolutionary algorithm until we get the solution that we want. It's actually about dissecting the operating principles of a biological system, and then we're using the, the um, machine element to test whether our assumptions of our models are correct. So for us, the, the machine element is nothing more than a model validation tool. If we're right, and if we implement our models correctly in a machine system, the system will be able to behave. If when we implement our models, the system can't behave, something in our models is wrong. So there is a fundamental difference between working to an AI solution and working to understand the organic solution. And we're working to understand the organic solution as the top priority. I agree with the concern that if we ever ran an evolutionary algorithm, would it get out of control? I would think still that people would need to be really dumb and really short-sighted about their intention and application for that to occur. Uh, that's not to say scientists can't be dumb and short-sighted, but one would like to think that we're actually getting a little bit better at these kind of things. In terms of where bionic brain could go, the timeline that I'm working to is that in four years, I want to have a computational model, an algorithmic model of the key behavioral systems in the honeybee. Um, and the key behavioral systems would be learning and memory, olfactory processing, visual processing, and then navigation. Navigation is very complicated, but I'm hoping that we would crack the core elements of navigation. Navigation becomes complicated because the entire, within that is the entire problem of action selection. So it's not just about what stimuli have I processed, it's about what behavioral response do I manifest in response to those stimuli. So these are quite lofty goals. So I'm hoping within four years that we will have a core level of understanding for those processes. Um, and we'll be able to implement those in a version of a, of a machine framework and a computational framework. Where the project then gets exciting beyond that is the capacity to use that as a tool to explore, in a comparative sense, other neural systems. So, for example, we can ask if we have the principles of navigation from a honeybee, how are they same and different to the principles of navigation that we imagine for mice, mammals, and humans? Um, there'll be interesting solutions there as to how navigational capacities might have evolved, but also insights there as to how we might develop autonomous systems that could manifest that kind of level of performance. There's also the capacity to use our model to ask fundamental what-if questions. So we know the honeybee has to shy of a million neurons. We know its sensory integration centers have about, if I get this right, um, have about hmm, 60,000 neurons in each one. The question would be, for example, if we were to triple those in size, how would the system change in performance? So would we be able to move the system into a different level of emergent behavior? Or would the system just become, have a greater sensitivity or fidelity or resolution or information storage capacity? We would start to ask those questions almost of, not running an, not running an evolutionary algorithm, but we could ask if we imagined a different sort of brain, what sort of 
capacities might that brain manifest if we were to change with it and play with it? And that, I think, will be the next step for another five years of work. And then ultimately, again, we should be able to scale up systems towards something like a human brain scale and ask the questions, if we simply scale the honeybee up, would it have a capacity to manifest the kind of behavior that, that a human brain model might manifest? Or is there something fundamentally different about the wiring and the organization of, the, of a larger brain compared to a smaller brain? I think that if you scale up elements of the bee brain, I think that we would see emergence of new levels of processing. Um, but I think that what we already know about the human brain is that there are elements of the human brain in which there are circuit organizations that are partially innate. So for example, we know we have bits of the brain that are particularly good for language processing and language production. It's not clear that simply by scaling up numbers or connectivity that we would manifest that in the honeybee brain. So I think we would actually learn a bit of both. And I think that's where we'd have this very, very informative tool. And that would really, by having that perspective, it's really going to get a, help us get a handle on what it would take to model and, and understand the human brain. There's, it is interesting to parallel the cooperative organizations of other societies other than humans. And the honeybee is an interesting parallel. Um, the honeybee is phenomenally good at working as a cooperative unit. And personally, I think, again, that goes back to its fundamental motivational architectures. Personally, I don't believe the bee sees or is, is aware, aware of in soft, fluffy terms, whatever. I don't think an individual, <coughs> sorry, an individual honeybee is aware of any difference between working for the benefit of itself or the benefit of its colony. I think for an individual honeybee, both of those are entirely equivalent. And I think that's quite core to why the honeybee is able to solve such successful social solutions and also why humans struggle with a truly cooperative solution so much.